virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you authors and the artists that you love to our politics and prose community. If at any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase the author's book, Crying in H Mart on the Politics and Prose website. Hooray! <laughs> and additionally, you can ask our you can ask our guests questions by clicking on the Q and A button, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And while we will try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. And finally, we would like to thank you for being here with us today. We are so thankful to our family of loyal customers and new friends for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's guests. Michelle Zahner is best known as a singer, guitarist, and wonderful person who creates dreamy shoegaze inspired synth pop under the name Japanese Breakfast. She has won acclaim from major music outlets around the world but for her releases like A Psycho Pomp, which came out in 2016, and Soft Sound from Another Planet in 2017. Her next album, Jubilee, will be out this summer, but you can already listen to the videos for the singles Be Sweet and Posing in Bondage, which are both available now. And next up, we have Karen Shi, who is a stand-up comic and Emmy-nominated writer for Late Night with Seth Meyers. She has also written for the Golden Globes and Amazon's Yearly Departed, for which she was nominated for a WG, WGA award. WGA award, okay. Recently, she was featured as one of Vulture's Comedians to Know in 2020 and listed on Variety's Power of Young Hollywood lists for 2020 as well. She is also working on a book of her own, a humor collection, which will be coming out with Holt Books. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Michelle Zahner and Karen Chi to Politics and Prose Live. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Bye. Hi, Karen. <laughs> how, are, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I just want to start by saying congratulations. Your book just came out. Um, how are you feeling about it? I'm feeling great. I thought I would be um, kind of like... Uh, I, I felt like the day would feel more surreal, but it was actually um, really emotional and it felt like, uh, in a good way, and it felt like um, just like so fulfilling and exciting and uh, I can't believe the response that it's already had and it's just wild to see everyone taking pictures of their books and uh, posing with them. <laughs> I don't even care if they read it. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just <laughs> thrilled. Just yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, if people don't want to read the book, they can just directly Venmo you and leave this chat, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just pose with the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a yeah, little tear. <laughs> and then throw it away. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's the dream. That's what we want with all books in the trash. <laughs> um, no, I had the joy of reading your book. It, I cried so much reading it. Um, it it's the story is obviously, it's really personal, it's really beautiful, and you also, I thought you did a really, I was really impressed by the way you were able to wield this very personal story and make it something that you were comfortable sharing with people, and also as the reader, it felt like I was almost your best friend, like you were trusting <laughs> me with all this information about you and your family, and it's just a true privilege to get to, to, to have read it, I'm so grateful. And I wanted to ask, um, I guess, how did it all start? How did you think like to write it down, you know, maybe outside of your journal and how did you think to make it into a book? Yeah, it started, I think in like maybe 2015, I had moved to New York uh, with the idea to sort of set music aside and try to make money for the first time. <laughs> so I applied to like all these kind of administrative jobs and got this job at um, Colossal, which is like this hand painted mural advertising company that like, you've probably seen them all over Brooklyn, uh, but I was like a sales assistant. And so this is in the book as well, uh, where like I had to um, make little maps and like uh, descriptions of where walls were so we could try to like market them to different clients. And I was, um, you know, just convinced that if I actually spent a year dedicating myself to climbing the corporate ladder, I would just like shoot on up there. Yeah. And I just like 
was like, you know, I, I was diligent about it. I would work from like, you know, nine to 7 p.m. And like, I just felt so unfulfilled, even though I ate, you know, like, even though I ate the sweet green at lunch, like at my desk and like just was working the entire time, I would go home and just feel like completely unfulfilled. And my mom had just died and I was like trying on this new life. And I felt like, really surprised at how quiet I became after she passed away because I'm such an open person and I'm such an outspoken person and I found myself like having a really hard time communicating to other people how I was feeling um and so around this time after uh this is such a long-winded story after I (laughs) um after I would go to work I started going to therapy for a a short while and and I was like so tired so I would get off work and go to therapy and like take the train take it back and I couldn't ever like feel comfortable and I had this like really stark moment where I was like do you think that you would be happier if you just like bought a nice lunch like once a week, like instead of this like hundred dollar copay um, going to therapy? And I just decided um, for me, that's what I wanted to try because it just wasn't working out for me and I, I could never really get comfortable. Um, and I started following these YouTube videos um, from Mang Chi, who's like a yeah. Korean YouTube blogger. Um, and I, I started making um, all of these Korean dishes and it was like such a therapeutic thing for me. And I thought it was like a cute little kind of like Korean Julie and Julia like type yeah, moment. Yeah. <laughs> and so it really just started like um, as an essay that was like an ode to her. And around that same time I had finished mixing Psycho Pomp and um, it was like the year end review uh, at my work. And I went in thinking like, I'm gonna get a raise. I've been here for a year and they were like, actually you're doing a really bad job. Oh, no. <laughs> and they felt like, I feel like the CEO, like he was like kind of a cool guy. He had like tattoos. I think he thought I was like kind of funny and he felt really bad for me. So he's like accidentally said, like, if you like, this takes you so far back. Like if you want to like have a two month severance to like, you know, leave, like we, we can give that to you. Oh, and wow. I, and I took it and around that same time I had like one glamour magazines essay of the year and like that was sort of like the seed of the idea and around that time I sort of like had this like financial support to like give music a shot and like write on the side of that so that is like a really long-winded way of like answering no that's an excellent (laughs) answer um chock full of so many details that was that was so fascinating (laughs) I love the idea that you went in being like I'm gonna get promoted I'm gonna get a (laughs) raise They're like, we'll fire you gently. Um, yeah, it was, it yeah. was pretty sad. You were like submitting songs for your work and they were like, we, this is done doing it. <laughs> this is not, I was like, no, this will sell the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, you, you look at the wall. Um, that's amazing. I love that so much. I also think it's so fascinating that you were trying out a, a different kind of life before you then wrote a book, which I also feel like must have been a different like lifestyle change too, as you were writing it than you know, the kind of writing you were doing before as a songwriter too. Did you feel like you had to sort of rethink your identity as an artist or your voice in any way as you were writing it? Um, I studied creative writing in college and I feel like that was a, a really informative part of my writing process. I think I always felt like a writer of some kind or at least like a storyteller of some kind. So it didn't feel like it was too far off from what I was already doing. In a way, like writing songs, um, you know, and and writing prose is is sort of like you're pulling from the same puddle of memory. And you're basically just like leaning into being a really sensitive person, which I tend to be pretty good at. Um, but I, it wasn't until like I started writing the book um, in its entirety uh, that I started to feel like, oh, this is really different from writing music and it's a lot less intuitive and I've never felt uh so stupid in my life (laughs) writing (laughs) writing this book I feel like (laughs) well you don't come across stupid at all in the book or in person (laughs) (laughs) um I will say my my mom read your book and she now oh my gosh and she also I messaged you after she told me this because she read the book book before you right she did I got the copy and she was like oh this looks great (laughs) and took it and I was like okay um and where is your mom where is your my mom? mom is here she's like two rooms away oh really um, 
Yeah, yeah. My mom is basically, yeah. So she wrote the book and she was like, she refers to you by your first name. I think she's just like, Michelle, like as though you're best friends um, and also invited you over for dinner anytime we're in the same town. Yes, so that sorry. sounds amazing. Are you guys in, in New York? Um, we're in South Korea right now, actually. Are you in South Korea? I had no, I, yeah, forgot, yeah, I had yeah. forgotten that. Oh, oh no, God. that's okay. Yeah. Um, so wait, what time is it? Then? It's 7 a.m. It's 8 a.m. It's 8 a.m. It's 8 a.m. It's 8 a.m. Yeah, That's yeah. early. <laughs> oh, no, it's totally fine. I've been working, I'm like working remotely for late night from here. So this is like a normal time to be up. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, also would be up at any time of day to talk to you. So this is very really <laughs> <laughs> Where in Where in Korea are you? Um, right now I'm in this place called Pundang. It's like pretty close to Seoul, I guess. Um, but wow. my grandparents are here and we're, my mom and I are here to help take care of my grandma. And so, oh. yeah. We're all in this That's like so tiny sweet. little apartment. It's very cute. <laughs> that is so cute. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but you talk a lot in this book about your family. Obviously, you also talk about your aunt who's in Korea. Um, and I would ask, because it's such a personal story, how did you feel about, you know, like your aunt reading this and your family members reading this and your husband reading it, who's in the book a lot too? Yeah, my husband was um, definitely a, a big uh, first reader and editor of the book. And, and I, I definitely don't think I would have gotten through it without him, um, just because I feel like it's such a lonely exercise and requires like so much perspective that you're just bound bound to lose over and over again. So I was really lucky. Um, I have tortured him quite a bit with uh, writing about him in, in many different <laughs> forms. So he's like pretty used to it by now. Um, my aunt, uh, I was probably the most worried about, um, she actually does not speak English very fluently. There's a lot of, um, sort of lost in translation moments in, in our, in the book that, that we sort of go through together. Um, but the book is going to be translated into Korean. Um, but I think that it will happen probably, I think it happens like a year afterwards. There's a publisher called Munhak Dongne is like publishing it. And, uh, I am very nervous about it because I feel like especially um Korean people but like a lot of Asian people or like I, I guess like other cultures I feel like in general are more private I feel like um mm -hmm. and uh so I definitely was worried about that and, and and it was definitely um that was like maybe the only person that I was worried about just because like uh I didn't you know there's this certain like entitlement that you have to wield I feel like as an artist in general and uh, mm -hmm. a certain place that not everyone wants to go to with you um, but ultimately I felt like I felt like I tried to be generous with everyone and I tried to just present things honestly and and we'll just have to like give her a fair warning that a lot of it is probably pretty triggering for for someone who's like gone through that kind of stuff but I am I am really looking forward to like her reading about like these very deep feelings that I have towards her because that we've always really struggled to communicate in a way um and it's such a complicated thing to talk about and I feel like she's the only person that really knows like what I went through in a way and so I am looking forward to to her reading like especially there's a chapter in the book called Little Axe where I had a lot of um fear of of visiting her after my mom passed away because it almost felt like similar to my culture it was like, does this family even belong to me anymore? You know, like that was a strange feeling was like, is she still, am I allowed to reach out to my mom's sister and like still have this like real um, like intimacy with her in the same way that I did when my mom was alive. That was something that was a real fear for me. So I, I, I'm curious if she, if she knows the full extent of that or if she felt that way at all. Yeah, oh man, I mean, I, I, I don't know her, but as somebody who, <laughs> a third party who wrote the book, I think she would be so pleased and so, you know, touched too. I, she also, you talk about her so lovingly in the book and she seems like such a generous and like warm person, you know, and um, yeah, I'm sure she'll be really pleased. Oh man. I, I hope really so. I think so too. We've gotten like really close um, over the past few years and I've, I've gone back to Seoul um, quite a few times uh, with my husband and it's kind of nice because like I feel like we have this new relationship where it's like my husband and her husband and I can all go out and it's like almost like a double date you know? <laughs> like, and it's like a cute like new experience where we can sort of enjoy each other more as peers and not like a like a babysitter type of you know yes. like labor or something like that we can actually like you know, enjoy each other's company and experience things together. So we went to like, the last time we were there, we went to um, 
chunju together and we like uh, -huh. uh like ate um have you had hongo hue by any chance uh no i don't think so do you you know what that is i'm not sure Wait, what are you saying it's like hongo hue oh hongo hue yes yeah, yes yeah yeah. Like yeah 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 have yeah. you had do you like it i do i really do you I like honestly, it i honestly am down for i will eat pretty much anything I think is the thing and I often don't ask what I'm being given yeah, yeah. until afterwards um and then I go oh yeah that's like that's pretty cool like I had um I can't do you know what like nakji is I think you maybe mentioned it in your book where it's yeah like, yeah yeah I know yeah, I got in trouble on like wait wait don't tell me I, I talked about tan nakji and like they, they're all these like say? Well, they're not on the show, but there were a oh. lot of people that were angry about it. And they were like, have you seen Octopus Teacher? Like, you know, oh. Octopi are much smarter than you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, I got told I by the vegan. what's yeah. smarter than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like <laughs> it. I like that. But Home Away yeah. is like a little intense. For, yeah. for, those of, for people who don't know, it's like, it's skate, right? Or something. I really have no idea. It's There's like a so fermented, it's fermented fish that smells like really intensely of ammonia. Yeah, you know, I trust you because I actually don't know what ammonia smells like. There's so much. It smells kind of like urine, I feel like. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Um, I basically, I think my experience with Korean food is like falling around my family members and they're just being like, here's stuff to eat. And I just go like, great. And I think oh, really? there's more stuff when I, um, like even in America, when I bring non-Korean friends to a Korean restaurant and you know, there's like so much panchan out there and I'm like, oh, this mm -hmm. is really good. This is really good. And they sort of like- They're like, like what, what is it? Is yeah, they're like, what is it? And I'm like, I really don't know. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that or I only know the Korean name and I'm like, I have no idea yeah. what it is in English. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I, we had like Minari the other day and because of the movie, I knew about it and we were oh, eating yeah, it. Yeah. The first time I ate it was a couple, well, I think I ate it before, but the first time I was aware of what I was eating was a couple months ago. Um, and when my grandma mentioned it was Minari, I was just like, what? Like, I didn't know that's what this is. Like, I've just been eating this. <laughs> yeah. Have your fam have, has your family seen the movie in, in Korea? Yeah. So it's I really popular in Korea, right? I think so. I mean, basically on... Like, I think uh, when I'm watching TV here, people, there are like cutaways and like almost commercials for Minari, but for Yoon Yo Jung specifically, I think everybody's yeah, like, yeah. really proud of her. Um, and yeah, it's really fun. I think they're screening the Oscars or they're playing the Oscars. I don't know on what, I can't remember what channel. Maybe it was like on Chozone or something. But um, yeah, my grandma is really excited about it. My grandma hasn't seen it. Uh, but she was just very excited for Yoon Yo Jung to get like international praise. Um, I think that what she did was like so incredible, honestly. Like it's the most baller thing to be a, of that age and not have anything to prove and and still have like the gusto to to get in there and like dig in and, and challenge yourself. I yeah. like find that to be so inspiring. And she also has this sort of vibe about her where, um, like I was talking with a couple of people who do movies and stuff here in Korea and they were all like, we've seen her do a very similar character in Korea and we know it does really well here. Um, and that's like a type of like, mm. film that people were like, oh yeah, we know this person, you know? And to see that do so well in a very sort of Western context too, especially when it comes to like awards where people are very like, you know, kind of snobby about stuff. I think that was really exciting and surprising to see. Have you seen her other work? I'm not like familiar with her other work. Is she is she typecast as like a certain type of woman? I don't know enough about her body of work to know if she's constantly typecast that way. I think her the so she recently what my grandma and I've been watching is she has this thing called like Yoon Stay, which is like a branch off of this show called Yoon's Kitchen. We should talk about your book. I don't mean to go. <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> um, but it's I basically like it. a reality show where she has a bunch of like actors on and they run a uh, like a bed and breakfast almost for people and you can sort of see her real personality in that or it's a reality TV. tv show it's a reality tv show like like really Hyori, cool. like Hyori's bed and breakfast exactly exactly yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is like the thing and in the soup is kind of like that too have you seen that no I don't the know. bts <laughs> show no i haven't seen i'm it. not a big i'm not a big bts i i don't know much about them but that it was recommended to me and that's what i've been watching lately but it is funny that like koreans just really enjoy like wholesome reality tv of like bed and breakfast vibes <laughs> yeah i mean i think i was thinking about it, i was like it is the dream to go to a bed and breakfast and realize that like the owner of the place is yun like what a dream <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I would go. Yeah, I would love to go we, to that bed and breakfast. We would have to go 
it'd be fun. <laughs> um, okay, wait, so back to your book, though. Um, so you were talking about the writing process, and I was wondering, now that the book is out, just because it is so personal, and I know your songs also at least feel very personal to me as a listener, um, but does it feel like your, your relationship to your experience has changed at all now that it has become so much more public than it was before? I feel like it's about to change a lot. I think that when I went in on it, I just didn't think about people reading it at all. I think that that's just been my go-to process of art making because it was only when I totally stopped thinking about, um, you know, like my ideal like spectator or whatever that I, I, I ended up, um, finding success as an artist. Like when I when I wrote Psychopomp and when I wrote the first essay for Crying in H Mart, I just went in saying exactly what I what I wanted to say, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and investigating what I wanted to investigate and and um, sort of exploring the things that interested me and writing it from like the most honest place that I could. And it was like such a wonderful response to that that I just kept trying to do that. Mm-hmm. And I just tried to not think about many people reading it at all and now that it's like coming out I'm kind of like fuck (laughs) (laughs) I've definitely been asked this question a lot I've done a lot of press in like in the last like couple of weeks and that's like been a big question of like you know how did you like are you nervous about writing something so personal I was like man should I have been um and I think that over the course of the next couple of weeks especially because it's going to take people like some time to like read the book and you know it's, it's not like a record where you can just throw it on and, and be done with it in an hour it takes like quite a bit of time to to read a book um and engage with it uh I'm 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 definitely like oh maybe maybe I should have been a little bit more more nervous about it but now that it's out there I'm like well there's not not anything I can do but um <laughs> you know like if yeah. if I think about like the artists that I really love I think that they all have that kind of quality and I think I've I've, I've read a lot of uh, you know writers talk about like it is kind of like the scariest things um to confront and put out there that end up being like the most uh engaging and, and f- fulfilling work you know um, yeah. so that was sort of what I used to encourage myself to kind of go deep deeply in there <laughs> no I love I love that you did that I'm, I'm 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 very grateful that you did that as somebody who got to benefit from it on the other side um yeah I mean that makes so much sense and I also think you know I'm sure it'll also provide a lot of comfort to people who are, you know, have gone through a similar thing or maybe going through a similar thing currently. Because I think something about grief is that it makes you feel so lonely and makes Mm -hmm. you, it almost makes you feel like you're the only person in the world who has ever had these emotions. And um, I think oftentimes when you are grieving, if other people know about that, they're afraid to reach out to you in that context or, and so to have a, a, a book like yours that feels so much like a friend, I think, yeah. Well done. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so <Sure>. <laughs> um, when you were writing about your, when you were writing about your family and especially about your mom, were you, were there any parts of her that you were really trying to make sure came across or that you were like, this is something I really want the reader to know about her? Um, just because I think it's scary. Anytime you, you know, try and write about something, it's really hard not to lose an element of somebody just because it's you know people are so fully dimensional and books are so words on paper despite how much you know they can convey what were some of the things that you really want to make sure people carried with them I think I just really wanted her to be as detailed and multi-dimensional as possible and like part of that was just I wanted to throw it all in there you know and I also mm-hmm. wanted um to be clear that there was a lot that I didn't know about her um Mm -hmm. one thing that was interesting to me was I you know I I I would be remit I I knew that I had to express this sort of particular type of like often Korean cruelty that can come sometimes like accompany like um mothers in the sense Mm -hmm. of just I think Korean people in, in my experience they can be very judgmental people and they're very, um, or at least my mother and and a lot of my family and myself, I feel like they're, they're, 
she was very judgmental and very critical of me, but it was coming from a very loving place. Um, and mm -hmm. for a long time, it was something that I just felt was like so idiosyncratic of, of her character. And it wasn't until I became a young adult that I began to realize that it's, you know, it's actually more of a cultural thing. Like, um, and, and once I, I made more like Korean friends, it was something that we could like really share together this kind of um, confusion of interacting with the Korean parent when you're, you're raised uh, in America, because, you know, I don't know any Amer you know, every time I came home from college, my mom would be like, honey, get on the scale. Like, weigh, weigh your, you know, like, I really think a hundred pounds oh, is wow. your perfect weight. And if I had told like any of my American friends that they would have been like, <gasps> like, oh my God, your mom like makes you get on the scale and all that. Um, and, you know, there was like a very particular like cruelty that came with her, but there was also just like a very, very deep love and a very like, just completely um, sacrificing like love that my mom was like so dedicated to me. And um, it was just really important for me to like explore all of those aspects of her. I love um, the sort of details about uh, just how obsessed with like aesthetics and appearances she was and, and her interest in, in QVC products and uh, you know, mm -hmm. cleanliness and like maintaining a house and I, you know, all of that was like sort of what made up this like, you know, woman and then just discovering later that she was like kind of dabbling in, in the arts and, you know, felt things very deeply. She was very like moved by, um, she was like very moved by art in a curious way and um, by nature. And, and I just wanted to capture it all in like as many like sort of tiny details as possible to just get, for people to get a sense of, of who she was and in her complete entirety of flaws and, and, and qualities. Yeah. I mean, that I think all completely comes across too. It, it really, um, I think you did, a, it was such a wonderful time to see somebody who was painted in like both her quiet moments and her public moments and mm -hmm. to see all of that and be like, oh, sometimes these don't add up, but of course that's true for everybody. Nobody's like, you know, it, it like, our sort of gross way of putting is that nobody's a brand, you know, ever, even though there is sort of like a public facing image for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's fascinating. I love reading about moms and I love reading about, you know, Korean moms. And um, I think there is such a, like there's such a single stereotype mm -hmm. <laughs> of Asian moms that I hate so much. And totally, so anytime yeah. I read about a mom that feels real, you know, um, or that just feels like fully dimensional to me. I'm always like, oh, this is great. Like more of this should be out there. Um, yeah, that's that's really cool. I actually, that's really funny. I had the opposite of experience once where uh, when I was in college, one of my friends who is white and from the Midwest was telling me about how every time she went home, her mom put her on a scale. I was like, her mom- Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being like, holy, what? Like how? And I went home and I remember telling my mom like, this is what she does. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. That's a very fascinating- yeah, moms, 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 moms. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you described different kinds of moms in the book. Did you, do you feel like your, uh, do you feel like your mom had other, I'm trying to uh, figure out how to phrase this. So I guess kind of like what you mentioned just now, if you finally met other people who had similar moms to you and you were very excited about that, did you ever get to see their moms firsthand? Were you ever like, oh, this is something that resonates. It does feel like a community of people who are like-minded. Moms that were like my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not firsthand. I mean, I think that in the same way that like, you know, there's always like this front facing person and like you're, you're never gonna know. I, I think even like, you know, I remember being so obsessed with my best friend's mom growing up because yeah. she was a young, she was a young mom and she was very cool. And she just like, you know, was let us, you know, put a lot of trust in us and like, let mm -hmm. us, you know, like be teenagers. And then was it felt so like they were best friends. And I was like, always so envious of her. Uh, and it wasn't until we were like in our, you know, mid twenties that we, she was like, you know, I was really envious of you and your mom's relationship. And oh so I feel like that's just a really, you know, like only, you know, like really uh, the depths of like how complicated your relationship is with your parents and uh, you know, on the front face, like it see, I think a lot of parents seem like really appealing, especially when you're younger, because you know, they're not ever coming down on you and, and like keeping you from, from something. Um, so I just, I, I feel like it's, um, I, I feel like I've just, now that I have a broader like online community or like more Korean friends in general, like sometimes if I, 
mention like you know I'll complain about something that my mom did I'll I'll find that like that's that is um like I remember being so frustrated when I was a kid that like my mom hated uh any gift that I gave her uh and I would always get so angry at her because I was just like just say that you like it I'm your kid like I don't know and I'd be like 10 years old and I'd give her a piece of crap and she'd be like why did you like waste your money like don't give me this and um and I felt like no one's parent ever did that. And I, and then, you know, I've, I've like heard from other friends that that's like a very like common thing that like, they just like are looking out for you and like, don't want you to spend your money. And now that I'm older, I like totally do that too. I just like get really uncomfortable with gifts and like, don't like to receive them and like have a really hard time withholding that I like don't want something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but certainly like any, you know, you don't have to be a Korean person or an Asian person to be like that. I feel like there's plenty of like other races that, that are like that as well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a fun, like, quick thing to say. Um, yeah, I think there is also, it's so interesting because I've, this is something I, like, struggle with a lot, too, and I remember uh, when I was reading, I was like, oh, I, I, I was really grateful to see this sort of tension there because I think I would imagine, this is a sweeping generalization, but I would imagine a lot of, especially Asian American f- people feel like which part of my identity is specific to me personally which part of it is specific to a culture right yeah and is that something that is even separable like can you parse those you know can you parse those little traits away from each other um and yeah and that was something where I was like man I struggle with that constantly um and it's very annoying when that's kind of like a stereotype of any kind but I think you did such a lovely job in your book just being like no this is a person here are all the different qualities I'm going to talk about her and um it was, it was really nice. Yeah, I liked that so much. It felt like, duh, some of us have these qualities and some of us don't. Um, yeah, I mean, I was definitely super nervous about like, you know, I think I just had to lean in like as honestly as possible about all the different aspects of her personality because I, I certainly was very nervous that like my mom would come off as just like the stereotypical tiger mom. And there mm-hmm. were certainly like some of those stereotypes that she, she definitely did um, exhibit, but you know, that's why I, with that in mind, I felt like I had to go in really deeply with all these different details to kind of like balance that out and to re- make sure that I was representing these other things that were maybe not stereotypically like what people would um, assume from, from an Asian mom, I guess. Yeah, I really love that. You know, I think something that was really cool is I actually didn't think of your mom as a tiger mom, you know, because yeah, I, yeah. I always wonder if, and I, the idea of it, of a tiger is so like I don't know if I actually know any Asian moms who are tiger moms like it was truly I think Amy Chua put that out there and I was like that's who you are <laughs> like good for you <laughs> yeah. um but the the way you portrayed her I was like oh she is doing this out of love you gave her so much generosity you gave her so much mm. fullness um and of course that's who she was as a person so that you know fully makes sense I that's fantastic um a, a question I was curious about is I feel like every time I read a book especially if it's something that has affected me in some way it's sort of continue to live in my brain for a long time afterwards, you know, or I'll go out in the world and something will happen. It'll remind me of this book I read. What was something that you were hoping a reader would, you know, keep with them after they were finished reading your book? That's a great question. I, my, like, I think that my ideal reader, honestly, was like, was like a mom that would read this and think like that, daughter really loved her mom you know and like um I I hope that like like if if I could imagine my mom reading this book by someone else I feel like my mom would say to me like oh I hope when you die well I hope when I die you write a book (laughs) about me like this you know like in this sort of like scolding way like that was sort of like my ideal um takeaway is like uh is that and then you know I actually just like saw a video today of like a girl talking about you know like oh I'm like I read this book and, and, and it made me like really like miss my, you know, miss my mom despite like all of like the the sort of issues that we have or like we had a fight two days ago and like I read this book and it makes me like want to call her and like, you know, spend more time with her or like apologize or something or just like appreciate her. Uh, I think that that's sort of um, what I want people to, to take away. And also I think that it would be great if people could just like fall I, I like fall back in love with their culture a little bit more and, and realize like how like um fragile of a thing that can be and and how like yeah. special of a thing to protect it is and and continue to interact with and preserve and and appreciate um 
So yeah, I mean, I've had so many responses to this book already that have like totally blown me away. I guess mostly I just want people to like, like it and, and feel really deeply about it in some, some yeah. way or another. No, I truly, I, I think when I, well, I first want to say that the beginning part of what you said, the just sort of target dream demo <laughs> sounds like my mom who genuinely <laughs> loved the book and oh, that's was really so fun. moved by how much you loved your mom and how open you were about talking about it. And I think, um, yeah, she's very excited to meet you someday. She's very excited ah, to meet you. Like oh my <laughs> so God. Um, yeah, I, it was such a, it's such a, it felt like holding a very tender thing, you know, um, and as I was reading it, because in the beginning, you know exactly what's going to happen, and the mm-hmm. last third, like, think about it now, I'm, like, tearing up. I truly just sobbed as I was reading the book. <laughs> this is mortifying. People are watching this conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like legitimately, it's very. Here we go. This is gonna happen I think, in every one of your book talks. By the way, you've done this to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the thing you were mentioning, which you also talk about in your book about, you know, feeling like your mother was a bridge to this to Korean culture and to this sort of world, essentially. Um, how are you? How do you feel like you're connecting to it now? In addition to like Mang Chi and your aunt, are there have there been other new and maybe surprising ways that you feel like oh I do have access to this and I do have ownership of of this culture? I guess like a big part of it has been the response to other people. Like I've done a lot of interviews and stuff where with um, full Korean people who are like you're more Korean than I am, and just like getting that validation because it's always. Yeah it's felt like so threatened in this new way, like since my mom passed away that I'm not uh, Korean enough or something, or there are these like some, some, some gatekeeping that can happen in our community that, that makes me feel threatened in that way. Um, And then to have, to be embraced by the community in that way definitely makes me feel uh, very validated in in writing about my experiences and, and, and reminds me that, um, you know, like I, I, I belong to, to uh, Korean, you know, my Koreanness in, in, in whatever way I, I want to. Um, but it's been really great, like, getting to go back to Korea um, for my for work, like for either playing shows or to work on the book uh, at retreats. And I think that once the pandemic is over and it's safe to travel, I, I definitely am looking forward to going there again and, and connecting with my aunt again and having our relationship really blossom into what it is. And getting to explore more of Korea because I only ever visited Seoul growing up. And, and um, now that I'm older, I've gotten to like go to different parts of Korea, which has been really fun and appreciate it more. That's definitely opened me up to my our, our culture. And um, I think eventually if I were to write <clears throat> another book and I don't know when this would happen, but I would like to go. No, I'm kidding. Sorry, no. I would like to, definitely not soon. Uh, I would like to. <laughs> Um, move to Korea for a year and like finally become fluent in the language and document the sort of process of of challenging myself to to learn the language that would be be because I feel like if I didn't make it into a project it's never going to happen because I've struggled to learn Korean I've gone to like Hangul Hakkyo like my entire life and just like was so like um I just like didn't care you know I just like it was Friday and I like didn't want to be in school more and so um, I feel like now as an adult, I would love to like document that process because I think not only just like learning, like if you're if you spend like a concentrated year somewhere and you document, I think that's interesting for anyone, not even Korean people, um, but also just like being in your 30s and like, is it possible to like, like documenting like the possibility of learning something so new like that um, I love uh, would be yeah. would be really that's like my next I- ideal like interaction with with it. Oh my gosh, I hope that happens soon. That's I know, I know. I feel like I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. I feel like I have to tour for like a couple of years and then after that I'm gonna like force my husband to uproot our lives on uh to Korea and, and get to live there for a year. No, that's that's amazing. I that's really thrilling. Um yeah, I mean I will say I, I've been living in Korea since last June at this point. I got here for my grandma last June and was like, there's no real reason to go back because we're all working remotely. But something um that I I, I would love to discuss with you something because you also talk about you did the program at like Yonsei Deakyo and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, is I I think before when I was just visiting here in sort of short spurts to visit family and it was just so family focused, it almost felt like I was coming to a foreign country, but just to visit to see like 
maybe eight people you know what I mean it wasn't mm-hmm, actually, mm-hmm. actually like, yeah yeah the larger culture at hand um but it is really wild in a way that is almost difficult to express of being like oh I wake up and I see Asian people everywhere like I it's Korean people like on my television and like in magazines it's like that's you know that's the norm and um, mm. it is it it like opened up a huge part of my brain that I didn't even realize was shut you know and um yeah yeah what a truly wildly yeah it's a very cool I'm you know man I hope you read this book I'm excited to read it (laughs) (laughs) my mom is gonna be excited to read whatever you you we we can finally have dinner together (laughs) yeah 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 it'll be fun you can come over she was truly just like planning out like we'll do the cooking part together if Michelle wants to and then we'll all uh, eat together. I love that this is all good she's busy do you, but... you get, do you get recognized in in Korea um like no but I also everyone's wearing a mask but also I'm not famous mm-hmm. so it would be if yes, I got you recognized are. no <laughs> I'm a top 10 famous Korean in, in no. <laughs> that's very funny <laughs> um I, I don't think I'm famous at all I think I I do who do you think the most famous Korean in America is? I guess Steve Yoon, maybe. Yeah, or Sandra Oh, maybe? Yeah, Sandra Oh, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. One of, yeah, John Cho, one of them? Yeah, one they're of all those. Like, yeah, <laughs> they're all, like, top level. Um, I Because we have a very sort or of... Or, like, D-list. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm a letter. I don't think I'm on a list. You're an absolutely a letter. <laughs> Thank you so it much. may be D with me, but <laughs> no, we're, we're you're massive. Are you kidding? <laughs> um, it has been, uh, yeah, I, yeah, me, yeah. I, my grandma has very, uh, she like knows everybody in this neighborhood. It feels like, and so going out and like going to the butcher, going to like the like the fruit store or whatever, you know, to buy fruits. It's like, oh, like you're so and so's granddaughter. Like I'm like, yeah, I'm doing, you know, whatever. Oh, that's how you're a celebrity there. Yes, it is. <laughs> true. You're a celebrity with your harmony. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it is, yeah, it makes me feel very, I'm like, this is how I want to be associated. I like this very much. <laughs> um, I think we're supposed to move on to the q and I know there are lots of viewers who are huge fans of yours and have questions, so I'm going to open this really quick. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, great. A lot of people have thumbs up a lot of things. I have, um, like, been smiling so much that I have Asian glow. <laughs> I'm trying to like tame it down (laughs) I love it I love it so much um okay I'm just gonna read through this uh the first question is from Helen Richard um hi I'm half Korean and I lost my mom to cancer last year I found your piece in the New Yorker in the weeks after she passed and it resonated so much with me you articulated so much of what I was feeling I guess what I'm still feeling and as awful as it is I felt like I wasn't alone so I just want to say thank you and also ask what do you do when you're really missing that one dish that your mom used to make? I go to H Mart, Helen. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's like some things are just like never quite the same. And like, there is a part of it that makes you really sad because there's this frustration that you'll never quite get there. But I think for me, cooking became, especially as like a non-religious person, became like this little ritual uh, for me to like just privately have a moment with myself uh, where I think about my mom and then I try to get something as close um, to how she used to make it. And I think that I just love thinking like my mom would be, I think very tickled and also kind of like weirded out uh, by my obsession with, with this. Like if she knew that I made kimchi she'd be like why are you doing that yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. she would think it was uh really silly and so um I you know I feel like it's a type of self-care like I think that that this whole experience of of, of cooking Korean food um was very much a type of, of self-care for me it was like carving out an actual you know like period of time because it's like one thing that's really beautiful about cooking is that like it takes time you know and um spending like even just like half an hour like preparing something and and being in the moment and like sort of letting that memory kind of like wash over you and then like nourishing yourself there's something like really you know obviously was something very magical for me and and why I I chose to write about this experience and even just like going into an H Mart and like you know looking at this like I I actually went to an H Mart today and um 
you know, I was just like thinking about, I like saw kimbap and I was like, oh my God, like I remember my mom used to make kimbap like for my hangulakyo. I remember like she would always say that like, it's the perfect picnic snack and, you know, just like taking the time to think about those things. They like make me really happy. And for me, so much of like the beginning of all this, uh, which I wonder if you are going through too, is that I couldn't remember my mom before she was sick. And that was really, really haunting to me. Uh, and I, I felt like so much of, of learning how to cook and, and taking this time to like enjoy memories that didn't involve her uh, when she was sick, but before she got sick uh, was a really, really important part of my, my grieving process. And um, so, yeah, that's what I do. I, I learn how to make it and, uh, or I, I order it out and, and, and I think about my mom and, and, and how we used to enjoy eating those things together. That's a really lovely and generous answer. Um, <laughs> that's wonderful. That also leads me to a question, which is, has, has H Mart acknowledged this book? Have they reached out to you at all? Yeah, we've been talking to H Mart. I think that they're kind of just like, well, we don't know what to do. About, you know what I mean? Like, what do we do <laughs> together? Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I did. I actually, I wrote a very tender um, letter to the CEO of H Mart. Oh, um, okay. Kind of just like thanking them. I don't, I do know, we did send them the book. I, I don't know. Um, what they think of it. I mean, it's a very, it's very much a love letter to them. I would be surprised if they like, <laughs> if they like sent me a cease and desist. No, no. <laughs> terrible. But uh, uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, know, like this is pretty like unfamiliar territory uh, for them, obviously, and like for me too. And so hopefully eventually like we can do, I would love to do like an event there or something. Also it's like the pandemic, so like everything is busy, but eventually I would love to like, uh, you know, like, have my book like sign books in the nature mart I think would be so fun but we that have no be. plans of yet I think I need to go and go and meet them in I think they're in New Jersey I have to like go to New Jersey and meet them but yeah. we have been in touch I, I have to like uh I'm not sure what we'll do together yet but I bet there'd be a collab soon yeah yeah wait are you in, <laughs> are you in New Jersey right now I'm in New York I'm in Brooklyn oh gotcha 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 okay that makes sense yeah um but I think they're in New Jersey I think they're like uh, flagship like is in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I feel like one of my friends t texted me once when she went to an H Mart in New Jersey and said it was the biggest one she'd gone to. So this all tracks. And in my mind, it's now big enough for you to have a concert there. So that would yes, be really yes. cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That sounds amazing. Um, okay. Sorry. We're going to go through some questions. Okay. Somebody named Francisca says, did your process with songwriting inform how you approached H Mart? Vice versa, did your approach to writing this book change how you approached Jubilee? That's a great question. Um, I feel like they were definitely in conversation with one another. They're, the real Japanese breakfast heads will, will find that there's a lot of borrowed lines um, and a lot of uh, borrowed titles um and that was like a really fun thing it's like these like dropping these little easter eggs but they were also um you know i i felt like i had explained it best uh in songs before and so i would just you know why why would i try to rewrite it if it if it worked before so it was fun sometimes like writing lines like that there's a there's um a chapter title called the heavy hand which was a a lyric in the song rugged country off off my first record psycho palm that was about the same experience that i was writing about where you know my my when my mom passed away my dad took her ring off and put it on my hand and it was you know it was heavy because it was i'd never worn a ring before and it, you know the physical weight of it was very jarring but it was also just like it felt like such a heavy burden and it, it felt like it encompassed that moment um, so yeah, I, I definitely feel like they're in co uh, conversation with one another. And for Jubilee, you know, I feel like af after writing two albums largely about grief, and after writing this, in, you know, going into this like huge deep dive, saying everything that I wanted to say about that experience, I feel like I was really able to literally sort of like close the book on grief in a way and kind of like focus my attention on on a theme that um, was like, you know, in total you know, the total opposite of that. Like the new record is about joy. And in a lot of ways I felt like it was almost like permitting myself to like experience joy again. And it was also like about embracing the feeling for the first time after, you know, kind of disassociating through trauma for, for so long. And so I feel like um, the book really helped me kind of like start this new new chapter. And, and I was able to like explore this, this new theme that I've never interacted with before. And, and that was really fun. That is amazing. That's so cool. I love that it was that it's like all different 
parts of the same journey that you're on too. It's like, you're, you know, that's really cool. I love that so much. Um, okay. There's somebody from somebody named Kim Joy says half Korean here too. Uh, something yeah. I'm discovering, <laughs> something I'm discovering Happy. a lot recently in the openness in the Korean American millennial space is that we're becoming more vocal about our experiences. This has truly made me feel much less isolated in my own upbringing. Have you had a particular discovery that you've realized is actually very normal for mixed Asian American families? For example, your essays mentioning two dinners, which was definitely my house. Mm. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I, I thought was really interesting that I don't think made its way into the book was, <clears throat> um, you know, I think it's a very common feeling that like you don't quite belong in either sphere. You're not quite Korean and you're not quite American. Um, and I think that that's a feeling that even if you're full Korean and, and uh, live in America, you feel or like if you're Korean adoptee, like you go through that kind of feeling as well. Um, and so I feel like that was something that I definitely uh, felt. I had some really great conversations with um, Mitski about this and uh she was saying that you know that is like so much a part of our identity is like not feeling like we belong uh anywhere and there's something really beautiful about like growing up that way there's like this is sort of like real strength and uh that sense of isolation I guess you get really tough and um you know I've, I've met some people who who've said said things along the lines of like you know I don't feel half Korean and half um American I feel whole Korean I feel whole American. And I actually don't relate to that at all. I feel like so much of my experience is actually like this feeling of, of being displaced in, in both um, communities. And like, that is very much uh, my identity. And I don't think that that's something that we have to be sad about or have to protect ourselves from. I think that it's like a very unique part of our experience. And um, for me, like when I was like, it, in my mind, like I address this in the book by sort of calling attention to like not quite belonging in either community, but but sort of carving out my own sense of belonging with 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 my art and my work. And I feel like I never have felt like I belonged more than on like the sort of stage I've created for myself or the sort of sto stories that I tell. And um, and I think that that even more than like a Korean person or an American person, I, I, I identify more as like as an artist, as, as my sense of purpose and who I am as a person and so I feel like that's something that that maybe other people can can relate to as well yeah I love that so much I, I really do I think there's also something that you're saying of feeling more like an artist than feeling like you know one whole thing or the other makes me feel you know I think sometimes the idea of representation gets so flattened in the way it's talked about and it almost feels like you know we don't wake up every morning thinking I'm Korean American and I'm gonna go about <laughs> yeah, my day yeah. in a Korean American way and yet I think that's what a lot of people who maybe are white expect that that's what representation should look like and those are people you know who have the power to do that very different thing but I I love that answer that feels very honest and that also I I, I can't remember where I read this recently but there's an interview maybe it was a Steve Young interview where he was talking about how being there's being Korean and there's being American and then there's being this sort of Asian American identity is its own third thing. And I was like, that's so true. You know, it's not, it's not either. It's just a weird, it's its own new thing. And I think, yeah, I relate to, I relate to that a lot. Um, okay, so we're gonna go to the next question this is by somebody named Jack Chen. Um, I have a question about the music played in H Mart, at least the ones in Nova, which <laughs> is Northern Virginia. Yeah. Um, do they always play so much indie music? Do you know if that's the H Mart aesthetic? I hear Bell and Sebastian a lot, and I'm always hoping. That oh yeah, Sunday. that's so funny. We should write to them and be like, please include us on your. Playlist. Yeah, that is like the the playlist, like the ultimate playlist that I uh, would like to be a part of. That is really funny because it is true. Like I feel like maybe like the CEO of H Mart is like a hipster or something, and because I do feel like I've also heard Bell and Sebastian yeah. at an H Mart. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and there is, uh, yeah, I guess like, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I don't have the insider know of like the H Mart playlist. I wonder if we searched for it, if, if it would be like a public thing that they probably have running. That would be amazing. But I was <laughs> actually, that would be, fun. yeah. I don't know what their essay is. I'm surprised they don't play more Korean music, but I guess they are, you know, they're just, they're trying to appeal to the hipsters. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, Okay, cool. So this is from somebody who is anonymous. Um, as Asian representation continues to trend upwards, do you ever find yourself discovering how much you are missing it? 
I ask because as a kid, I don't think I ever felt the need for an Asian superhero, but seeing the recent trailer for Shang-Chi made me feel sad that Mm. I never had the chance to see that as a child. Yeah, I mean, that's so funny that like, it felt so like out of the realm of possibility for us growing up that we didn't even think to miss it, you know? Like I never, I also never thought like, I wish I had an Asian, you know, I think also a lot of this kind of stuff is like, you don't realize it until you find it in a way. Like, I don't think I, I ever spent my my childhood being like, I wish I had someone to look up to. And it was only when I found that person that I was like, whoa, there's not a lot of us, huh? Like, yeah, I feel like yeah, I had that totally. same experience with Karen O when I discovered her. And I think I was like, well, I never even realized that all of the guys, like all of the music that I listen to are like white, men you know and like finding her and being like I I think I just you don't even realize like what you're missing until you experience it in a way um and then it makes you yeah then it makes you kind of sad I guess because like I think part of what makes you so sad is that like you're so used to sort of like um like identifying with other people you know and and or like identifying with this sort of like neutral body that is usually like a white person and and you just don't think about it until you actually do see yourself and you're like well I didn't even realize that was something that I was missing before I definitely feel that way um I think like I'm I'm mostly just like happy and excited for kids that like get to grow up with that you know like I I feel like Korean culture has like become like such like a coveted thing you know and it's like a really like it's something to be so proud of and there's so many like fun parts about our culture that are being like celebrated in a huge way that like I remember when I was in high school and like no one knew or not high school but I remember in middle school like people being like where's Korea like what is that just like you know and they they only knew where China like if you weren't Chinese or Japanese it was like well what are you then how could you possibly be another type of Asian and when you said Korea was always like jokes about North Korea or like, you know, yeah. where, where is that? I've never heard of that. So it's, it's been really wild to see like so many uh, people like get to enjoy Korean food and Korean cinema and Korean music. Um, and I'm just really happy for like kids who get to grow up, grow up with that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I get to like interact with those things too. It's been like such a joy. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Um, <laughs> We're, I'm so sad. We're pressed for time. This is going to be your final question. Um, okay, we're going to say... Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, this is... I'm going to read it really fast. This is by somebody named Jason. And Jason says, grief is very much like a roller coaster with ups and downs as you discuss the triggers of crying. That was in parentheses. So grief is very much like a roller coaster with ups and downs. As we know, grief evolves over time and never really leaves us. Rather, it changes and we grow and evolve with it. How do you feel your grief has changed over time to where you are now? What a final question. I'm sorry to ask <laughs> at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You know, I think it transforms so much. And like so much, I, I feel like there's just, um, I've realized that there's just no skipping steps and it's going to like just take the time that it needs and you know, I think that for anyone that's dealing with grief and it's so raw and, and fresh and it can be like hard to even know how to like take a shower or like get out of bed or like breathe. And and you're basically kind of like relearning how to be a person for so many years. Um, it gets easier. And, and, and I feel like it's just I, I guess it's just it's it's become easier to like um, remember my memories of my mom fondly and, and not painfully. And that is a real joy. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. Um, thank you for such a wonderful time. This is truly a big joy for me. To be oh, here. Karen, I'm so grateful for it. Thank you for kicking off our virtual book tour. And yes! thank you <laughs> to Politics and Prose uh, for, for having us. Um, we are so, I'm so, so grateful to both of you um, for being a part of this. It's so special. And thank you to everyone who who bought the book and is reading the book. And uh, it just means the world to me. I'm, I'm just truly honored. Uh, so I'm going to close it out. I have one last question for both of you. And again, I'll, I'll do all the thank yous after, but like, <laughs> what are your, so since we are a bookstore, I got to ask, like, what are you guys currently reading and what would you like to suggest or, you know, to our audience? I'm sure they're interested to see what's on your bookshelves. I truly, I have a, uh, so this was maybe like three or four books ago. So I think last week I read um, How to Do Nothing or recently I have no sense of time I read How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell uh, oh, and I'm late to the party book. I know it came out I think a year and a half ago maybe but it's brilliant it really 
restructured my brain and the way I think about things. And it was very helpful without being like, um, a, you must do this kind of book. You know, I, I really, really liked mm. that. Um, yeah. And now I'm about to speed through some Chang Rui Lee. So I'm very, very excited. Me that. too. I have, ah! I just bought Chang Rui Lee. Like, <laughs> That's That's I, I, I just start reading it, but I'm, I can't wait. I love native speaker and I'm so excited to, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to check out this book. Um, and I also just picked up, I, I watched the show and I, I loved the Friendly Woods, uh, uh, Martin Scorsese, Scorsese uh, Netflix show. And so I was so curious about uh, reading her books. I'm reading the, the new uh, Friendly Woods uh, essays. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Michelle and Karen, for your time, your energy, and just all of your warmth. It was wonderful having you here. And thank you, everyone who stayed, who came to listen, who bought the book. Um, your patronage is what enables us to bring you exciting events like this. And we cannot continue to host these types of events without the book sale to support them. So please support um, our wonderful guests and politics and prose by using the link in the chat to purchase crying in H Mart. <laughs> so check our website Yay. for the most current updated event listings as we have a great list to choose from. And we do hope to see all of you again. And thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you so, so much again, Michelle and Karen for your time and your energy and Ah, and the best thank of you. luck, Michelle, on your virtual book tour. We are just so honored that you kicked it off with us. And yeah, so everyone here, stay strong, stay safe, and stay well read. And we will see you all next time.